Welcome to the Alternatives Mason podcast with host Brittany Mason, Chief of Staff at Bonnery and Capital Management. You'll learn how to build alternatives knowledge brick by brick. Bonnery and Capital Management uses technology to help independent advisors scale and educate themselves on alternative investments. And since education is such a big piece of what we do, we are excited to kick off the series to dive into the myths and bricks of the alternative space. Hello, everyone. I am Brittany Mason, your host of The Alternative Mason, and we are here for another episode. We're so excited because we have a very special guest on today. Meet Dan Harms, a seasoned professional with a passion for finance and wealth management. As the CEO and co-founder of Third Wire Asset Management, he brings a wealth of experience to the table. With an impressive 19-year background in various wealth management roles, Dan has an extensive knowledge of portfolio construction and alternative investments. Mm -hmm. With expertise in portfolio construction and alternative investments and a healthy skepticism towards wire houses. He brings a unique perspective to his role. Prior to starting Third Wire Asset Management, Dan operated a proprietary tra trading platform and co-founded by a Chicago-based IRA. He also led a single-family office focused on investment management and estate planning and tax strategy. His career began at Smith Barney, where he advised high net, high net worth families and conducted equity research and trading. We're so excited to have you on today, Dan. Thank you so much for taking the time to do this. Thank you so, for having me. Yeah. Thanks for coming on. So I really want to dig deep into, you know, your background and how you really got started in the finance industry. That's something that specifically fascinates me is, you know, our behavior and our relationship to money and how it's formed at a very young age. And so I would like to, you know, know, is there a particular one of your earliest memories perhaps that you have uh, in regards to money and how that began? I I kind of think the catalyst for me getting into finance was uh, two prongs. One, I worked at, at, as a trade clerk in the 30-year pit in the Board of Trade for about a year when I was 20. Uh, and that's really where I found my voice. And you, you can't be meek there. And you, you get used to people yelling because that's just how business is conducted, not that you did something wrong. So that was, that was a good... Uh, cutting on my teeth into the the loud boisterous nature of finance uh in parallel to that it was like a random weekend i happened to be home at my parents house and saw their merrill lynch statement sitting on the counter and knowing how old they were and like just general idea of i mean even back in 2000 or 99 the 60 40 existed so just looking at that from the perspective of their statements, it was like all stocks. I was like, this isn't good. Invested <laughs> in was not suitable, appropriate, and uh, it was a, a raging disservice. And so that sort of led me to the financial services industry to learn everything I could, the right ways to do things, the wrong ways, and uh, just get better and, and do better. Yeah. Yeah. What was the most challenging experience that you had there? At Smith Barney? Mm -hmm. Oh, um, I mean, I started right at the, the bottom of the tech wreck. So um, morale was at an all-time low. Um, I mean, I think the biggest challenge, I don't even know. I mean, it was watching just the the, the pain <laughs> like the client attrition but at the same time for anybody starting out it was the, the heyday of generating new business and new relationships because you could pull coals in anybody else's game so easily um so i mean it was it was not your your normal time uh, it wasn't like the the go go 80s or 90s um I don't know. I think that I guess one of the biggest challenges were seeing 
what was available investment wise to clients and how inferior they were. But the at the time I just saw it and thought that was the the status quo. That's what was available. It wasn't until I left Smith Barney and went to go run the single family office that really the wool was lifted from my eyes and I saw uh, how much more was available and how less expensive it could be to put a, a proper asset allocation and portfolio together and not have the fees upon fees upon fees that people just take as business as usual. And then from there, what inspired you then to start, you know, third wire asset management to go on, you know, on your own and take that leap? Um, I mean, my experience in the alternative investment space really began at that single family office. Uh, it was a lot of hedge fund management, private equity management, real estate management. Um, and it was seeing how just the the fees coupled with the, the perceived due diligence or stated due diligence, whether that was actually being done or not. Uh, and that when you went further down the wealth spectrum, more towards accredited investor status and even beyond to mass affluent, that those investors were increasingly getting taken advantage of. And that space today has become one of the, the last untapped resources of net new assets. And everybody's got their forks and knives out and they're coming for them. And I think that Third Wire can deliver an alternative investment solution to that space better, cleaner, and cheaper than anybody else out there. And what do you feel sets you apart or makes you so unique? That we actually stand behind the managers that we've selected and that we allocate to. We're not just a, an access only platform where here's a hundred individual strategies, go nuts. Uh, you're not going to run into the paradox of choice or analysis paralysis by using third wire. Uh, an advisor or a, a family office executive would only need to determine suitability, which should already be done. If you're any good at your job and amount to allocate. And then we do the heavy lifting, the portfolio construction, manager selection, initial and ongoing research and due diligence, reporting, ease of investment processes, all of it. And did you always know, did you always know that you wanted to be on your own or was it because you found that this was such a specific need and an untouched portion of the industry? Entrepreneur wise, I think it's sort of multi-generational. Yeah. Like my, my grandfather's did something similar. Uh, okay. Father and now myself. And so the, the risk tolerance and appetite to create something on my own was already there. It was more finding something that jived with that, that uh, I had the experience, wisdom, and more so uh, idea that nobody had gotten to yet. And the planet sort of aligned in the, the middle of 2021. And here we are. Here we are. Well, congratulations. I mean, it's such a, a huge accomplishment. It's It can be, you know, it can obviously be a, a big risk going out on your own, but with big risk, there's big reward, like we say. That's the hope. Yeah. <laughs> so, and I love hearing that it runs in your family. I mean, you know, like I said, that just always cure. It's, it's always something that has interested me, you know, had interest for me. Um, is just our background and relationship to money because like I don't come from that and I you know learned everything really only in the last few years it's a totally new industry for me um but it's been exciting and you know I think everyone should you know do everything they can to to learn about finance and so that's why we really started this platform and you know hopefully our listeners are going to you know learn along with us so Let's see, what strategies do you use to, you know, motivate your team and 
um, get them aligned with what your company's values and, and culture is. Ooh. Um, that's an interesting question. None, I guess. <laughs> Everybody's sort of motivated on their own to uh, get to the same place. Uh, I don't think anybody that I've engaged with or who has engaged with ThirdWire or become affiliated with ThirdWire would have done so unless we were all facing the same direction, rowing in the same direction, trying to get to a destination together. Um, so there isn't really a need to like swing an axe over people's heads or provide a giant carrot hanging over their head to get them to move in a particular direction. There's a, a lot of self-motivation. And at the same time, once either they have already seen it or it, it takes very little by way of explanation to highlight and illustrate that the alternative space is more or less the wild west and it's really easy to take advantage and be taken advantage of and sort of our our mission is to act as the the white knight for advisors and provide uh, an educational component, sure, but also run a squeaky clean operation so that when they're allocating their, their clients to ThirdWire, they can rest assured that everything is being done the, the correct way and uh, without sacrificing any quality or, or result. And, and you said the educational aspect. Um, what do you do as far as education when it comes to alternatives? Well, I mean, like most things, it starts with discovery. And so you, you lead with assessing sophistication and experience in the alternative investment space. And a lot of conversations that I have with advisors and RAs begin just like that and nine times out of 10, the response is, oh, I'm in a couple private equity deals. And it's just, it's a forehead slapper because all private equity are alts, but all alts are not just private equity. And uh, I tend to view alternative investments on a liquidity spectrum where you've got uh, all private investments, but still either monthly liquidity or bi-monthly liquidity on one end. And then uh, like a 10 year long investment term, private equity or real estate deal on the other. Uh, and then everything in between. So advisors being more apt to allocate to a private equity or a real estate deal just because that's one, they're sticky assets, which is a whole nother issue I have with them. Um, but that it's more easily recognizable and they can get their heads around it and explain it to their clients. So it makes the, the client approving any allocations there much easier than branching out into the the rest of the alt space so it's explaining what there is how they operate and what the benefits are in moderation to an overall diversified portfolio why are they sticky assets um i a lot of our listeners won't you know, maybe perhaps understand what you're referring to. Could well, you so you you take any random private equity deal and there's a, they're a closed end fund. There's a, a finite capital raise in the beginning and then you make a commitment to the fund and then over the first, say, one to three years, they issue capital calls, they draw down on that commitment that you made and then hopefully in the, the latter half of the investment term, which can be really anywhere from five to 10 years, uh, they start making distributions. And then as you stagger these, the idea is that the distributions are paying for the calls in subsequent private equity deals that you got into and you end up with this J-curve looking thing. Um, when an advisor invests a client into a private equity deal, that client's stuck. Like there is no liquidity. They can't sell and get out. Uh, there is a secondary market, but they'd be selling at a really deep discount. So these illiquid assets much like your house become the last thing that you want to liquidate and get out of. Um, 
and all during that time, they're collecting fees mm -hmm. on these funds and the, the client is stuck. And so it's sort of the a well-known dirty little secret in financial services is that for private equity and real estate deals that have these supreme liquid nature to them, the the YTB, the yield to broker, is strong. And so some advisors prefer to go that route. Yeah. And that's so many issues I have with that. So many. <laughs> bleeding dry, bleeding them dry. Yeah. 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 Well, what so what kind of factors do you consider then when you're evaluating alternative investment opportunities? It's very similar to when you're constructing an overall asset allocation. I mean, uh, investment objectives, time horizons, risk tolerances, uh, risk tolerance especially because when there's a downdraft in the equity markets and or fixed income markets, they're two things most investors worry about. What am I doing against the S&P and can I get access to my money? And so our wheelhouse is on the liquid end of the alt spectrum and the the funds that we have created and provide to the, the RAA space have monthly liquidity with 15 day notice, which is about as liquid as you're gonna find in the private investment world. Um, so I think that jives better with a, a long-term diversifying aspect of a portfolio. And it allows advisors to rebalance when they need to, quarterly, annual, every two years, whatever the schedule is, whatever the, the, the goals-based planning they have in place for their clients are, the, the third wire portfolios are designed to mesh with them. Do you think the 60-40 is dead? I don't think it's dead. I think it's evolving. Um, I mean, as somebody that operates an alt platform, seeing the 33-33-33 is great, just because it means uh, larger allocations to alts and more money coming to us. But the there lies an inherent conflict of interest. It needs to be appropriate for what the the overall goals of the investor client are. I mean, if they're looking to buy a vacation home or pay for college or retire in 10 years, they don't need to be allocating to these very long-term illiquid investments. They need something more liquid so that in the event uh, they reach their goals sooner, they can access the cash and start taking distributions. Um, so I think there's a place for all alts, but it, it is really determined by the individual scenarios and, and situations of the investors. I'm really curious to know about how you build your relationships with your high net worth clients. So, I mean, you have a lot of experience in your career working with, you know, these type of individuals. So how do you go about building that type of rapport and building strategies for them for their unique needs? I don't. I work with their advisors. Um, well, and, that's, I, and that's on purpose because you have a, a direct investor that, say, Googled alternatives and comes up to ThirdWire and calls me. They may like what we're doing and say, oh, well, I want to write you a check for $100,000 and make an investment. Like, well, that may or may not be appropriate for your individual situation. I'd like to bring in your advisor and let's look at the whole picture and what you really need and how much of an allocation to alts your, your situation requires. So while it's nice to have the attention, working with direct investors is not the ideal. It's really working with a financial professional, with that investor in mind, and making a meaningful allocation to alternative investments that helps to mitigate overall portfolio volatility and diversify away from the, the two eggs in one basket, stocks and bonds. Could you maybe elaborate more on the your philosophy regarding like estate planning and tax strategy and how you integrate that in 
you know, with your with your strategies? Sure. Um, I mean, I think alternative investments relative to estate planning, when you have family limited partnerships or long term legal structures that were put in place for interge intergenerational wealth transfer, that's where you want to have your uh, private equity investments, your real estate holdings. Um, in more taxable structures, living trust, short-term grants, that's where uh, sort of more traditional hedge funds and to the liquid side, it's more appropriate. Um, so I think, in, and this is another reason for incorporating your, your financial professional in the mix is that Mr. Johnson calls me and says, I love the third wire 60, 40 portfolio. I'm going to put in my family limited partnership. I'm like, no, no, that's not good. <laughs> this is not where it should go, but I'm not going to be the one to tell you that. Talk to your advisor or let's bring them in. And then collectively we figure out where the, the best place to slot an investment with third wire or anything else uh, is, and you move from there. So what would you say are some of your favorite products then that you that you use? Your favorite? Um you see the, the best results with. I mean, the best results are liquid hedge funds, whether they be equity based or uh, derivative based, because this is one of the filters that we run. Initially and primarily it's the monthly liquidity, because if we have seven strategies in one of the third wire portfolios and one of the seven is quarterly liquidity, then the entire thing becomes quarterly. So that's one. Two, uh, uncorrelation to major equity and fixed income indices are a requirement as well. And a lot of equity-based hedge funds out there claiming to be long short are really just beta in disguise. And you don't get any sort of non-correlation when the equity markets take a nosedive. So you find that characteristic much more often in derivative-based hedge funds, such as CTAs or uh, relative value type strategies, where they take the, the market risk out and they're looking for a, a discount and premium to narrow to capture the profits. Um, I think that is much more interesting than the illiquid side at this point, because A, private equity is really just illiquid beta that if you are going, if you want to invest in private equity deals, make it part of the 60 of your 60-40. Uh, and then for real estate, I mean, I think there's some question as to what the market is going to do over the next four or five years with uh, yields going up and rates going up as much as they have. Uh, the magic eight ball is saying, outlook not so good. Um, yeah. So I think there's there's increased interest on the, the liquid end, and uh, that very much jibes with what we do at this time. <laughs> and just the liquidity alone, it's the, the better place to have your, your alt exposure. Mm -hmm. yeah the real estate market right now just a wild time what do you what do you foresee for the future of that really in the next uh, year um, so. i mean the next year i don't see a whole lot of um, new deals happening i think there's going to be uh a lot of treading water mm -hmm. and uh ensuring that uh, bills are paid and uh, leases are paid. Um, but I mean, there will be a time when uh, cap rates are in a position that real estate becomes uh, super attractive again, but you don't, when you, when you're sitting there on uh, various news sites and you see it, it's already too late. So you need to start getting a toe into the real estate market before the herd gets there and it becomes common knowledge. So probably two and a half, three years out, I'd start seriously looking. Um, but in general, once you make that commitment, you're stuck in place because of the illiquid nature of it. Mm -hmm. 
I think the going back to the the liquid end of the spectrum, you have much more control, and you can have instead of direct real estate ownership, you can have exposure to interest rates and sort of play that the same scenario without the illiquidity, um, and and profit from it in the short term. Yeah, it's um, while I was still banking, we just kept hearing it's going to crash. It's got to crash at some point. And it's just it doesn't seem like that's yeah, it's just been a slow burn. It's not not going to happen. Yeah, I yeah. I'm not a big believer in the, the soft landing. I still think there's a second leg down and that this recession is coming. Uh, but that's just my opinion. And it's worth exactly what you paid for it. Um but I don't claim to have a crystal ball. I'm not trying to pick market direction. This is very much uh, a time in the market, not timing the market. And you need exposures to various asset classes, equities, fixed income, and alternative investment strategies for the long term. You don't. You're not trying to pick bottoms and, and pick tops. It's you put them in place and you let them do what they were designed to do over the course of your financial planning. So with evolving tax laws and regulations, um, what do you do to make sure, you know, you're as well informed and with the potential impacts for, you know, tax strategy planning? Um, Well, one of the benefits for the, the liquid portfolios that we manage is that they have a static tax treatment. So any capital gains are taxed 60% long-term, 40% short-term, regardless of the holding period. So if you have what your gains are, you know exactly what your, your taxes are going to be as soon as the, the K-1s come out, which for third wire are about a month in advance of April 15th filing deadline. So uh, if an investor needs to file an extension, it ain't going to be because of us. Um, but for overall tax strategy, I think anything, obviously that's going to be kicking off capital gains often and, and in size, you ought to have in some sort of tax shelter. Um, but at some point when you're, you're moving up the wealth spectrum, those become less relevant and you've got a lot of your, your wealth in just large taxable entities and so it's more offsetting any of the the gains that you can um hopefully there's been a lot of uh, loss harvesting uh, through 22 and uh, this the, the dip in 23 um yeah that's about all the input i have on the tax side <laughs> So what's next for Thirdwire? Where do you foresee, you know, the the company going and growing? And tell me, tell um, us I mean, I don't know, three, four years, <laughs> world domination. <laughs> uh, no, we we want to continue to grow and expand and uh, provide a a better alternative pun, totally intended, uh, to the big access only platforms out there and. Uh, just continue trying to help and doing doing all better, cleaner, and cheaper, and showing the investing public that there aren't only two ways to do it, which also happen to be super expensive and complex. Well, what would you say are your three top goals for Third Wire for the next five years? Hmm. Um, I like the triple R AUM goals. Um, I want to uh, get our body count up to probably about 30, 35. And uh, at the very least start, depending on the real estate market, uh, think about our own office space. Not that we ever need it because third wire is designed to be office-less. And that's not really the... Uh, the direction business is going. Um, but I think in financial services, it, it'll, you'll never get away from needing a, a physical office space. So knowing that I'd, I'd rather buy than rent, getting to a point where we can 
buy that space and have it be ours and set roots. There is, you know, there is nothing like face-to-face, -face, you know, interactions and stuff. I know our world has certainly just become more digital ever since the pandemic. And now, you know, so many things are just this way through Zoom, which I mean, I do enjoy. I like that I can, you know, hang out with my dog at home on the green couch. But, you know, at the same time, I do, I really do value that FaceTime and stuff with, um, with everybody else so i do yeah I mean, it's, it's irreplaceable um i mean everybody yeah. talks about efficiency and i can have eight meetings in one day because i do it all from my computer like, sure but That's so yeah there's no there's no replacing the face-to-face -face and uh, the handshake and exactly. i mean at the end of the day we're all humans and that personal contact is irreplaceable and necessary absolutely absolutely i agree so I like a hybrid idea, you know? Yeah. Uh, start with the virtual meetings. And then uh, when you get closer, start doing the in-persons. Yeah. yeah. So, um, well, what would you say are some of your favorite educational tools or resources for alternative investments for those who want to learn more? Ooh. Um, I'm a big fan of the... Uh, the late David Swenson's books, uh, Pioneering Portfolio Management and Unconventional Success. Um, Google. I mean, Google is a fantastic resource. And uh, I mean, I know uh, depending on what you're, you're searching for, the internet can be a lot of garbage. But when you're reading about alternative investments, you tend to hit articles from... Uh, reputable sources and i think there is a an overarching goal to educate about alts so there's a lot of material that you can read it's not intimidating um easily digestible pieces that take 10 12 minutes and you can learn a little about the space over time and get up to speed fairly quickly yes yes all the resources are out there right at our fingertips. And this is a great podcast to begin as well. So thank you, everybody who is listening. Thank you so much, Dan, for coming on today and taking the time and, you know, just digging into alternative investments and sharing all the amazing stuff you're doing over at Third Wire. So we really appreciate it. And thank you, everybody, for listening. We're really excited to, you know, for our next episode. So be sure to tune in and we will see you next time right here from the Green Couch. The opinions expressed in this program are for general informational purposes only and are not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual or any specific security. It is only intended to provide education about the financial industry. To determine which investments may be appropriate for you, consult your financial advisor prior to investing. Any past performance discussed during this program is no guarantee of future results. Any indices referenced for comparisons are unmanaged and cannot be invested into directly. As always, please remember investing involves risk and possible loss of capital. Please seek advice from a licensed professional. <laughs>